Friends, our first lesson this morning comes from Psalm 8. Let us together listen for the voice of the Lord. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Holy wisdom, Holy Word, thanks be to God. I invite you to consider the universe. I know this is no small feat. Physicist Brian Cox writes, it is impossible to visualize the scale of the universe. I believe that is true, and we're still going to try today. Um, astronomer and physicist Carl van der Lute wrote about a model that can help us. And so for this model, we're going to build a portion of our solar system in the sanctuary today. So I need you to imagine our sun, a star that is over 800,000 miles across, is actually shrunk down to the size of this grapefruit, okay? So this is the scale model that we are building right now. Nancy, can I ask you to stand up and hold our sun for us? Thank you. Okay, so if the sun is the size of a grapefruit, then the earth would be the size of a grain of sand. A grain of sand is really hard to hold on to, so I picked up something a little bit bigger just so that it would be easier to hold. Luciana, could you stand up and hold the earth for us? Okay, so the earth is gonna be about 35 feet away from a grapefruit-sized sun, and then Tabby, can you stand up and hold the moon for us? You can both face the congregation here. And then if you could hold them about an inch apart, because in this scale model, the proportion is that they need to be about an inch apart. Now, Venus is gonna be about 25 miles away from the sun. And I didn't talk to you yet, but Rob and Gail, that's right about where you're standing. Would either one of you mind standing up for a moment and just being Venus for us? Thank you, I appreciate this. Pushing my luck having only been here a year, but calling on people that I haven't warned. Okay, and then Mars is gonna be about 53 feet away, and that is right here in this front row of the choir, so I'm gonna ask Jen to stand up and be Mars. So just so you know, the proportions are correct here because Brian was gracious enough to come into the sanctuary with me this week and measure things out with a tape measure. So we have the sun back here, Venus, the Earth and our moon, and Mars. And on this scale, the nearest grapefruit-sized star to our sun, that would be like our sun, is going to be 2,000 miles away. So I'm gonna need you right now to imagine that this grapefruit is in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, because that's about 2,000 miles from Indianapolis. So, and in order to complete a model of our home galaxy, the Milky Way, we would need approximately 200 billion grapefruit-sized stars. And that is just our galaxy. The latest estimates are that our universe is made up of at least two trillion galaxies. That is 2,000 billion galaxies. Some are smaller than the Milky Way, some are larger. And those are just the ones we can see. Scientists believe that there's a lot more out there that we can't even see. Can you imagine the universe? 
Thank you all for helping me. You may sit down. So keeping in mind all of that, I want us to hear again what the psalmist wrote to God. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? In other words, what is our place in the midst of a vast universe? When we consider the planets, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, how do we fit into all that? And why should God even give us a second thought? Commentator Kimberly Bracton Long writes, the psalmist's awe is obvious here. How can humans who are so small when compared to the vastness of the cosmos mean anything at all to God? And this is how the psalmist responds to that question by writing, yet you have made them a little lower than God. It's helpful for us to understand that in the Hebrew, the word for God that is used here is Elohim. And quite likely in this context, it is not referring to the one single deity, the one that we call God, but it's more likely referring to gods, small g, plural, or celestial beings. So according to the psalmist, who likes putting things in a hierarchy, we have God the creator, the gods or celestial beings, humanity, and then the whole kingdom of other living creatures. So what is our role in the midst of this universe? And the psalmist tells us two things. First, in verse five, we learn that God has crowned humanity with glory and honor. And second, in verse six, we read that God has given humanity dominion over all that God has made. So let's talk first about being crowned with glory and honor. God has given humans royal status. All have been made in the image of God, according to Genesis 1, and in this psalm, all are given royal status. This includes people of every age, gender, race, gender identity, orientation, ethnic background, ability, languages spoken, country of birth, citizenship, or any of the other ways that we try to categorize people. So any attempt to dehumanize any person or group, or any attempt to privilege one group over another, are counter to God's will and places that we in the church call sin. All are made for glory and honor. This is a beautiful reminder for us, especially on this World Communion Sunday. So if you don't remember anything else that I say today, remember, you are royalty, and so is everyone else. The second instruction that we hear in the psalm is that humanity is given dominion over all that God has made. Now that word dominion needs some clarification. As we all know, power can be used well and power can be abused. Some people have twisted this mandate from scripture as an excuse to exploit and abuse the earth and her creatures. This was never God's intention. When God made the risky choice to share power with all of us, God made lovingly everything from ladybugs to galaxies and has invited us to partner in caring for creation and for one another in tender love. Professor Marty Stussy writes, whatever dominion Christians have is dominion held in the name of a suffering servant who seeks to heal rather than, than exploit or retaliate. I wanna share two stories. The first is about a woman who taught me about honoring all and advocating for the oppressed. Her name was Tilly Black Bear. She was born in 1946 and was a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in the Sakangu Lakota Nation. 
A seminary professor of mine was friends with her, and because of this friendship, was able to take a group of seminary students to go visit the Lakota Reservation. And we were welcomed into parts of that community that would not normally be open to outsiders. Tilly Black Bear allowed us to sit at her feet and listen to her stories. Her own experiences of domestic violence led her to open her own home as a safe shelter for other women. And after seeing how much need there was in her community, she took classes towards a doctorate in counseling and founded an organization to provide support services for those who had faced gender-based violence. Now, she started this way back in the 1970s when most people weren't doing this work yet. She worked both locally and nationally to pass laws and to help create safe spaces for women. She saw clearly where women were needed protection and were not treated equally, and she fought to change these systems. Her work was so impactful that she earned awards from Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, along with being named one of the 10 founders of the anti-domestic violence movement right here in the United States. The second story I want to share is about one of the great warriors in caring for creation. Wangari Maathai was born in Kenya in 1940. She was the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn her PhD from the University of Nairobi. She was an author, a professor, and an activist who through her work at the university and the many volunteer organizations that she was part of, she became convinced that the root of most of Kenya's problems were because of their ecolog ecological degradation. And so, she worked tirelessly through organizations she created to mobilize communities all across Kenya to plant trees. She writes, we all need to work harder to make a difference in our neighborhoods, regions, and countries, and in the world as a whole, that means making sure we work hard, collaborate, and make ourselves better agents to change. Wangari went on to become the first African woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. Friends, in our own ways, in our own corners of this world, we can live out the call of this psalm, to work towards a world in which all are honored, and to partner with God in caring for creation. Let us remember in humility our, interde our interdependence with one another and the whole created order. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.